It's me, Undead Viking. I'm here to talk to you about this game. It is called Rivals. Rivals is a tactical miniatures uh, fighting game based on the sea of the ocean floor between uh, this these steampunky cogs guys versus these Cthulhu octopusy uh, nautilus guys. And uh, they are doing battle for, well, heaven knows what reason, but they are fighting. And, and lucky enough, we get to be the ones that control them and get to have these uh, wonderful uh, bloody and, and, and vicious battles uh, for for these this little spot of terrain on the ocean floor. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time with my introduction here because the, there's a lot of rules and there's a lot of stuff going on. So I want to make sure I get through that without wasting too much of your time. So let me show you how to play it and then we'll come back here and I'll tell you exactly uh, what I think of it. All right. Awesome. Let's do it. All right, everybody, this is Rivals. And before I show you how to play, I just want to take a couple of moments to tell you a few things. First, uh, this is not the full size of the map. There's actually uh, several tiles I did not place out, uh, though the one I'm going to show you will definitely uh, help you as far as understanding how the game is played. Uh, the reason for that is I just didn't have enough room on this smaller gaming table that I use for my filming. Uh, secondly, this is a prototype, so what you see in front of you, uh, while a very high level prototype, may or may not uh, look like the final uh, published product. Uh, I did get some, some awesome uh, 3D minis uh, that they that they, uh, they printed with a 3D printer and you can see that they're you know highly articulate and they look really cool and everything like that. However, um, some of them unfortunately uh, as with the resin, um, this doesn't have a base and stuff like that, some of them uh, broke uh, unfortunately. I was still able to play with all the different minis because I had all the cards and everything that are associated for every single one of the miniatures um, but uh, just you know I'm not going to show you the broken ones just basically because well like I said they're broken and they're tough and they don't really stand up. Uh, so, um, what you see in front of you, this is this board is made uh, randomly. These tiles all have this on the back, and you, you shuffle them all together, and you start in the middle, and you work your way out in kind of like a circular motion. And then after you're done, you place these tiles on either side. Those are the spawn tiles. That's where each player is going to begin. Now, if you were playing four players, you'd also have spawn tiles here and here, uh, and that would be so, so you have a four-player game. Now, even though if you have four players, it isn't an all-against-all. It would be uh, two players for one faction, two players for the other faction, and everybody would kind of, you know, they'd work together to take out their enemy. Uh, so... After you've got the, the, the game board set up, then each player can then uh, take the time uh, to build their force that they're going to use to uh, fight it out. In a two-player game, each person gets 120 points to um, stack out their their fighting forces and also their abilities. In a four-player game, each player gets 75 points. And as you can see, uh, like here, these are the cards for uh, the Nautilus, the, the people that are living underneath the sea. They don't... Here, I'll show you a couple. Like These are like kind of like the squid people, if you will. So, like, you know, here's like a little crossbow guy, you know, and so um, they are the ones that live in the sea and can breathe water and what have you, and the cogs are the other uh, group, and I can't help but think of Cogswell Cogs whenever I whenever I hear that name uh, from the old George Jetson uh, Jetson's uh, show but like you know and so these guys obviously they have a undersea suit you know with air and what have you and that guy's pretty cool actually so uh, anyway so yes those are the two different factions um you can argue amongst each other to determine who gets to uh, use which faction. If you can't decide, um, you roll two red dice, and whoever gets the most hits when they roll the red dice. In this case, that's actually a pretty good roll, because those are two exploding hits, uh, and then you'd re-roll those for exploding hits. But then, um, And then whoever gets the most hits would then get to pick which side they want, and then the other person had to play the other one. So, uh, if you're playing a two-player, like I said, you're going to take 120 points, and you can see there's the points for the different uh, people up here in the top left, all the way to like the big guy here, which, which is uh, the three-headed dogfish, which is, and the tail broke off this guy, but he still uh, stood up pretty well for me, so I, we played with him, and so like you can see, like a, like a big giant guy, and it, it's important to note that like with the bigger models, okay, sometimes he stands up, but with the bigger models, um, you do, you can put one big model in a spot, I'm just going to put him down. One big model 
in a location uh, like so, or you can put three small models. And unfortunately, um, my big model for uh, the cogs, he, he kind of snapped off the side. Um, and notice this is not going to be uh, the, the end result. Th this is this is a 3D resin, and so these are kind of brittle. And I and I tried super gluing them a couple times, it didn't work really well. But um, so you have uh, this model. Let me actually show you what it looks like. And so that would be their big giant robot automaton or whatever. And so when we used him, we just kind of put him down. But this is the other big model, and those guys uh, can only be by themselves in those spots. They they can't have anybody else in. Their spot. Um, but as I said, you can have three little guys in a location like that, and they can work together uh, in that location. And that's important because of the fact that when you're actually playing the game, you're activating uh, locations on the board to do your move actions and do your attack actions, uh, not individual models. And so being able to have several of your units in one spot is a very, very important aspect of this game. So, you will pick which models you want to play with. There's no, I mean, you're limited only by uh, the points that you spend. Notice you can't keep the points and spend them later on, on like, uh, upgrades and things like that um, when that you get uh, actually it's not say upgrades but abilities uh, that you use and like because I, I'll show you those cards again uh, you can see those abilities but um, then you have these cards that have either you know these are for uh, uh, the the uh, Nautilus the the underwater people and this is for the cogs and then these have a number up here in the top and these are special abilities like here's a bone sword it would cost six uh, you decrease your speed to zero when you use it and you gain uh, you know, plus one red die for one turn. Or, you know, here's a uh, rune, starter item, uh, heal a friendly model for three hearts, then you discard it. So, you can outfit your, your units as well with that information. You are limited uh, to one item, one armor, one weapon, and one ability per uh, per unit. You can't just, you know, uh, you know, give like a ton of weapons to one guy or something like that. But here's like, um, the Fizzwig ray gun. Uh, when attacking a range three or more, and then you notice that this, what this says here, it's a, there's a little tiny plus there. You might not be able to see it. But it says plus attack die. You take your highest, you take one of your attack die and you actually increase its color. Um, it goes, uh, White is the worst attack die, and then it goes to red, and then it goes to black. So if you had a red attack die, you'd increase it to a black. If you had a white attack die, you'd increase it to a red. If it was a black attack die, you can't increase it anymore. Now, in a decreasing situation, like there's certain things that will cause decreases, you would decrease a black to a red, and then a red uh, to a white. And if you had a white that you had to decrease, you would just get rid of it entirely, and you just wouldn't get to use it. So, you know, some of the other things, uh, here's a drill, uh, receive two extra aether when defeating lurkers, and lurkers are like these NPCs that you can see that there's these locations here, here, and here, where monsters hide, and I'll explain that in just a little bit, but so that would give you extra aether, because that's what reward you get for killing those those sea monsters if you're in those locations. And then, um, the boiler ball grenade, uh, this model may target all rivals in one hex at range two, and then discard it. And so, like, if you want to get a big attack to get everybody. So stuff like that, and you can outfit everybody. And th those are really cool. The items and stuff are really cool because um, if it was just like the the same uh, units over and over again, um, then it might get a little dull. But when you have a situation where you are able to, you know, outfit them and change them and and and, and change their abilities by by purchasing those cards, you know, obviously then replayability and, and and differences and things like that and combinations increase. So so here here's just like here's this guy that uh, this Reginald M Hornblower, and he's a cog hero, and so you can kind of see he's got and so the one thing I was worried a little bit was that you know maybe these guys would all kind of look the same or or that you know they you wouldn't recognize uh ones from another but if you look so like here's you can see um let me just check here let me actually grab the right one so if you have these these units what you have is uh fairly definitive markings on each one like you know this guy's got the weird mustache and stuff um you know this guy's, you know, got you know the, the the extra thing on the top and things like that, and so you can actually spot them really well, um, looking at the table and seeing what they can do and seeing what their abilities are just by you know by sight alone. And so, uh, you know, so you have like you know, like as I said, like 
there's this guy. And so let's just check out his abilities real quick here. Um, you know, Reginald R. Hornblower, he's a cog hero. And then for three Aether, and now you start off with three of these tokens, I should say, at the beginning, not four, like I just grabbed, but three. You start off with three, and then you can get more by defeating the sea monsters and defeating the lurkers, or you can search for loot in uh, like the, these coral isles here, and I'll explain that also in a free, little bit. Or, when you're rolling your dice, you might actually, when you're doing attacks, you might actually get, um, like, these little diamond results. Not that one. That's a shield. And uh, that's also a shield. And, like, uh, I know there's one diamond here. Okay, there we go. So, if you get these results, then you actually do get to collect um, Aether uh, from your attacks. And so, like, and, and the white die, actually, that is an exploding Aether result. So if you roll that, you get to roll it again until you get something that isn't an Aether result, and then, then you're done. So you can actually get a lot more. Whereas, let's see here, like, here on this red die, you can see there's just this little diamond there. But you can gain Aether from when you're doing your attacks as well. And it's important to note, also before I forget, because I always forget this, especially when I play, if you're fighting one of the NPC creatures, like here, like here's one, here's this giant mutated uh, uh, shark ogre that you could run into. Uh, if he fights somebody and defeats them, and uh, he rolls Aether results on his deck die, you add the Aether to his treasure in, in, his, uh, in his cave. And so that's something to note. But, so, you, so you have, um, for three Aether, uh, down the scope, you can add a red die to your attack. Uh, for one Aether, you, if two rivals are in consecutive hexes, one behind the other, Reginald can target both. And then, snapshot, uh, weakest attack die if targeting a model within two spaces. So you actually get to plus, increase the attack die, of the, of the one that's the close. So you can see he's got a range of five, He's got a speed of two, meaning he can move two, and he uses a black and a red die for attack, and a black and a red die for defense. And so then he's got six health as well. And so what when these units take damage, you are just going to then take these hearts and place them on there, and if he takes six points of damage, he's destroyed. And this game is fought uh, to the bitter end. You, you basically play until one side uh, takes out the other. And so, I mean, that is one of these whole things. And so then, if you purchased him, uh, you could go through your deck here and, you know, maybe, you know, try to find, like, here's a pocket cannon. If two or more damage is given to a target, then add an extra one. So maybe you wanted Reginald Hornblower to have this gun, and so then you just place that underneath him in front of you. And so you know that he has that gun, and if you paid that eight. So it's pretty simple and pretty straightforward, right? And um, that's kind of like the fun and like the beginning, like, you know, after you pick your guys and you, you that first like 15, 20 minutes of kind of going through your options and whatever. And I like it too, because there's a ton of options either. I mean, it isn't like you got like a, like a deck. You know, here's, this is, this is the deck for the items. It's in the same for both. It isn't like you got a hundred cards to go through and like scouring through and trying to find the perfect combination. No, I mean, I want, I want to get my guys set up and I want to get them on the table and I want to go and I want to fight. You know, that's what I want to do. So, um, before I actually show you the different things of what you do on your turn, uh, let me just kind of explain what you're seeing as far as the, the table goes. I've already kind of alluded to a few of the things. Um, these are the monster dens. Uh, when you go to a monster den, uh, you have the option, if it hasn't been discovered yet, you can say, I'm going to search in that monster den, and then what you will do is you have this lurker deck, and you will then draw a card, and you'll find what's in there. So here's a troll shark, and so you, you can see he has attack dice, of two black, the attack dice of two defense, two black dice as well, and then there's little, these stubborn, ignorant creatures are good for nothing, but fish bait, says, so says the Nautilus Elder, and has three health, and if you destroy it, you can either get two loot or two aether, and so what you have here, and I'm going to show you another cool model, here is this shark ogre, and I like this guy, he's pretty cool looking, and so then if that was the monster on that spot, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd populate that area and then of course you'd have to do battle with it and then hopefully kill it and get the reward now the two aether obviously is just if you defeat them you'd get you know these two aether you know you just collect those but if you decided you'd uh get two loot cards there's this big giant deck that has um loot in it and so then you just draw two loot cards and so and like so here you might just get a bag of aether which is just uh gives you uh plus five Aether on that particular location, or you know you might get something you know like this amulet, 
and then draw the top five cards of the loot deck and place them in any order you like, back to the top of the deck, and then discard this. And obviously, like, that would be situational. Like, if you know you're going to be, like, possibly killing uh, uh, a, a one of the sea monsters and getting their loot, you might want to do that, just so you can make sure you're, you get what you have. And then, you know, there's some things like just a shard, an aether shard, so you only get plus one aether for that. Um... Let me see if I can find another cool one. Now, a lot of these, I, I do apologize. I mean, you know, because it is, it, there's no picture, you know. But you can get, like, here, like, uh, stove door armor. It's armor each round when this model is first uh, targeted, the attacking model, you have, you lower their attack dice. And so, but, so it's just, like, you have, like, items like that. And like I said, there's no art on that card, but you probably have a pretty good idea of, of what it does as far as uh, the loot. And, you know, the art, obviously, is, I, I like the, the art direction this game's going, and I, I've seen some of the other stuff. They sent me some of those images, and it looks really awesome. So, um, that is those spots. Um, these are coral locations. Uh, it, you probably might be able not be able to see it, but it's considered rough terrain. If you're in that location, you actually have your lowest uh, defense dice is lowered uh, by one. So, you know, if you were using... Uh, Reginald M. Hornblower, uh, you would, you know, his defense dice, so his lowest is a red, so his red would go down to a white if he's in that location. So you might be saying, why would I go on a coral? Well, if you're in coral, you are able to actually search the coral and try to uh, find loot within it. And so, and that is um, just a straightforward uh, die roll uh, after you choose to uh, to search that. And I'll go more into that when I go into the actions uh, portion uh, of your turn. And the final uh, spot, well, obviously, these are just blank, and they're exactly what you'd think. They are blank. They are what they are. Let me move this guy out of the way here. Um, these, however, these are rocks. And rocks are just what you might think. They block sight. And they're going to block movement somewhat. And they also block uh, line of sight for attacks. Now, if you've played some uh, hex fighting games, you might really under this might be old hat to you, but basically think of it this way. If you have a guy here and you have a guy here, they can't see each other because of the, that rock that's in the way. Now, if you have a guy here, you might be wondering, well, do can I can these two guys see each other? What you have to do, because there's a rock here and a rock here, but there's this weird channel, can they see each other? The rule is, is if you can draw a line from one corner of a hex and draw it to another corner of the hex, and without having anything block it, then it is fine, and they these two units can see each other, and they could shoot at each other as long as they were within range of each other. And that's how the rocks work. Now, the second thing how the rocks work is, you can take a swim action, and if you are successful with the swim action, you will swim up to the top of the rock uh, location. And if you're on top of the rock location, then, you are able to, one, you can see over uh, any rock spot that is within one hex of each other. So if you're in this spot and, let's say there was a unit right there, you could see over this rock to see this one. However, if he was here, I couldn't because of the fact that, once again, I can't, uh, you know, I, because of the fact that the, this one is two spots away and it, it blocks me from there. So. Um, what you then have is that you're on top, but also if you're up there, you get to add a white die to your attack roll uh, because of the fact that um, you're up on higher ground, if you will, the classic higher ground uh, uh, bonus. Also, it should be noted that if you want to then move when you're on top of the rock, you don't have to swim. If, if rocks are next to each other, you can just walk from one to one, and just like that because you're already you know up on top of them. So uh, that is what the rock locations do. Now, when you set this up, it's because it's random, it's very possible that you might end up with a situation where um, maybe uh, there's like too many rocks in front of um, like the starting zone uh, for the spawning area, or maybe all of the layers are on one side of the map, and, and you know, for whatever reason, if, if the players decide that the setup uh, went uh, awry, if you will, because of randomness, you can mulligan it and, and, and redistribute, of course, you know, and so that's, you know, obviously uh, what you would do. That's not uh, too much of a surprise there. So, 
that's kind of like the real brief overview. Let me tell you exactly uh, what you do uh, on a turn so you can have a really good idea of what goes through the process. So regardless uh, to uh, whatever you decide, the Nautilus player will always go first. It goes Nautilus turn, it goes Cog turn, and then it goes Lurker turn, and then you start over. And there's no set number of uh, turns or anything like this. As I said, this is a battle to the death. So whatever team is, is uh, left standing after several turns uh, will win the game. So uh, after you, you, you set up, you'll put your, 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 your starting uh, people uh, in these zones, if you will, and I'm just, I'm not doing this for real, I'm just kind of showing that to you. If, for whatever reason, like, you have too many units and you can't fit them all on uh, to your spawn points, or you choose not to, after they've left the spawn points, then you can bring the other ones on uh, later on, you know, so after the first turn. So if you do purchase too many, you know, just to keep that in mind. Uh, on your turn, what you will be, what you will have is you will have this card, and you can see here it's movement actions, attack actions, and then end turn, and then draw event. So this is probably like the coolest thing that I, uh, I, I, I liked, uh, you know, or coolest thing about this game that, that really struck me. And, and, you know, very well there might be a game out there that already uses uh, this particular uh, mechanism, but I've never experienced this. Uh, what this is, or you know, or you know, maybe it's just represented differently or whatever. But regardless, I found this to be highly engaging and highly innovative, and very, uh, uh, I liked it a lot. I'm used to playing a lot of I go you go uh, tactical battle type games like this. You know, where one person, okay, I went, now you go, I go, and you go, and, and that's inherently kind of what this is but what this is is that you will have your three movement actions and then as i said you don't activate like a single unit you aren't going to say i'm moving this guy what you're doing is you activate the movement the activate the hex and say i'm moving that hex each unit can move twice or take you know two movement actions i should say because when you activate a hex for movement it doesn't necessarily mean that they're moving. Uh, they could actually be activating a movement action as well, which is up here, and I'll explain those in just a quick second. But you will then decide which of these three you're going to move, and then you, you don't have to move all of them. You know, you, you, don't, you don't have to. And then that would be a movement action, like so. And so then if you had another three units, like over here, then you could take another movement action like that and you could move these guys and then you could come back like maybe these guys moved on and this guy took a movement action and then you could take another movement action and you could activate just this guy so forth i mean but obviously that wouldn't be a very you know possibly not a very good choice of what uh what you're going to do because of the fact that uh you, you are uh you know you basically, you're maybe wasting your actions, if you will, because you're basically just moving the one guy when you could be activating a hex that has several. But, you know, it, 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 that's, you know, your choice, obviously. Then, you can see you have these three, and then these three attack actions. Now, inherently, you don't have to, you wouldn't have to go movement, and then movement and movement. You could go movement, and then use an attack action. And then move, and then move, then attack, and then attack. You, you, so you can take them in any order you want. You just have to go through that process. And then once all of your tokens get over here into the end spot, then you end your turn and you would draw an event uh, from the event deck, and then that would affect uh, the board. So, and that is like like i said it's kind of a neat way to figure out your turn and figure out what you're going to go and then you know what's really fun is like you move and then maybe you'll do an attack and then depending upon how the attack works out you will then uh use that knowledge uh to affect uh what your next move is going to do so you know it isn't something where you turn in all your orders and then hopefully everything goes to the goes to the best right so all right so Let's get on to the actual action. So when you move, it is exactly what you might think. You look at the speed of the person, and then you move them. You just, you you, you figure out where you're going to go. Obviously, if you want to, like, move, uh, like, you know, anywhere, anywhere you want, you can't move through a spot that has an enemy on it. And you, you can move through a spot that has, um, like, friendly units, like, so you have this guy. 
but you couldn't end your move in a spawn. You have to, you can't have more uh, of the, like, you can't have four units in there. You couldn't end there. But you can move through it to get somewhere else. And you could move through this spot that has the enemy in it. So, moving is very simple. Like I said, you can move each particular unit twice or do two move actions with each particular unit twice as well. Now, move actions are uh, very simple. The uh, well, three, well, technically four uh, move actions that you can do, as you can see here, are swim or land, charge, and share. Now, you can do these with your normal movement. That is very important to note. So it isn't like you're just standing here and you're saying, I'm going to swim. You're, you're, you're saying, uh, you know, you're, you're moving, like, say, you're, you're, you can move two, and then and you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my swim action. Now, when you swim... You're, you see, the idea is that these people are just walking on on the floor of the uh, of the ocean. But if you swim, you then can move faster. So it allows you to move an additional space. And it can, then when you actually move, a, you take do a swim action that gives you a chance of swimming up on top of the rock as well. Um, however, uh, it like which when you actually are swimming though, um, it degrades your lowest dice by a color so you don't you know you don't want to stay swimming necessarily unless you want to keep them moving going that's why if you can activate them again you want to then take the land action which as you can probably assume will then land you back down onto uh the the uh, ground which then lowers your speed by one but also then you know upgrades your your degraded die that you're already taking taken care of um, you can, if you're just walking, you can take the charge action, which allows you to move an additional space, but it degrades your weakest attack dice if you do that. So if you, like, say you, you want to get within range of this guy over here, and, like, this guy only can move one, and you have a range of two, you can go one, but I'm charging, and then you'd move an extra space, but then you'd be within, you know, like, your range of your attack that you wanted to use. But you'd have to degrade your attack dice by one. Um, you can then... Uh, also either equip, I, I apologize, you can equip and also share. I, I apologize, this, this, there's one other one on there. If you found a, an item, that, the, a loot item, you can then use the movement action to uh, equip that item. Or if you're in the same location as somebody else, you then can share an item with that other person and hand that to them. Something either one of your starter items or if, you, if need be, something that you found uh, when you looted either uh, a lurker cave or uh, a spot of coral. Before I move on to the attack actions, I do want to actually state, I, I almost forgot to tell you this, to, land, to swim up to the top of a rock outcropping, you have to roll a red die, and you have to get a hit uh, to pull it off. And this, this like, and a black uh, skull is a hit, a normal hit, a white skull is an exploding hit, but you, you would then get it, and then you could land on top of the uh, you know, the, the rock outcropping. If you don't roll that uh, and you attempted to do that on your turn, your movement is done, even if you had movement left over uh, for that particular unit. So there is a, a risk reward uh, there if, if you have that situation. So, but uh, moving on, I'm going to show you an attack here in just a quick second. But uh, when you do an attack action, once again, you activate a hex, and then you activate everything that is in that hex uh, when they can, um, in this situation, uh, either they can attack or use an attack activation, but not both. So unlike a movement action where you like did your movement action along with your movement, that is not the case uh, with this with, with the attacks. So if I have a a you know uh, a unit, let's say we have uh, this guy right here, and I wanted to attack him, I would go through the attack, and then we'd be processed that 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 turn. If I want to do an attack action, there are two of them, uh, search and recover. Uh, then I'd just do that, and I wouldn't be able to make an attack that round. Uh, recovering is uh, like any kind of degrading ability uh, or like being netted and things like that, which is something that can happen uh, during the game. Uh, you use recover, and those actions or those effects will list that on them and tell you like you need to use recover. And so you use recover, and that would like restore whatever negative you had put on you. Uh, you restore that back to normal, and you could then 
your, your unit would be good to go uh, the next turn. Um, a search, you can search a lurker den uh, to discover what's inside or, or search that coral, remember I mentioned that, uh, you can find loot. And when you search well, you roll, uh, to do that, you roll one white die. And if you get a hit while you're on coral, uh, you would get, and that would be a blank, That would, but you, there are hits on there, I swear, even though they are the weakest die, then you could get a loot from just searching the coral. Not the best chance in the world, but if you have a unit that can't do anything that particular turn, and you just want to like use an attack action for that, you know, pretty good action, pretty good uh, option, or, you know, if, if you don't have anything else going on. Um, I should mention that when you search the lurker cave, you just get it. It doesn't happen. And once the once the creature is killed off that was in the lurker cave, so like if this like giant mutated shark ogre uh, shark, you know, was 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 in there, a shark troll uh, was in there, and you killed it off, um, then units that are in there, you can see this it says defense, get a plus red die. You're basically hiding in the cave, and so those are good spots for having your units because you get that bonus red die whenever they get attacked. All right, so finally, let me show you exactly uh, how an attack works. And it is very, very straightforward. So we have this unit uh, from the COGS, and you'll notice he has that cool little windshield wiper on his on his helmet. Like I said, these models are just really, really cool. And, um, and, and I know that these are like, uh, pretty much what the molds are going to look like. I, 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 So just, you know, they've really outdone themselves with the sculpting here. Um, so, but here's uh, Jeffrey the Hammer Toe, and he's a cog hero. And so, um, Winch Wiper adds a, he, you, if I wanted to spend three Aether, I could add three. He's not being attacked. I'm going to attack with him, but that would add three, add a red die to a defense. And if there's two models and one hex, I, I could, you know, spend one Aether to do that. Um, you know, and then he has automatically when forming a charge, you know, he gets to add another one to his speed. But so here we go. Uh, so he's got a range of three and within two, he's got a black and a red die for attack and a black die for defense. So, and he is, as I said, we're going to just go ahead and put him there. And then we have, um, uh, this is our little squid here. This is Algernon Shift Chaff, and he's pretty cool. I like his crossbow. And uh, you know, and once again, like I said, the models are just super cool looking. I like, and do you notice that like how he's got a claw mark there, like he fought something and he lost an eye, and so he's got the bandana. I mean, it's just cool stuff, right? So here we go. So um, a war cry uh, boost to hex range two. Uh, hex uh, gains, uh, you know a. A white die to attack, so if but we're not doing that. Um, and then we have Prophetic Vision, you know, bonus to the weakest defense die. So we, if we had to spend an ether, we could do that. And then Mulligan, after forming an attack, Ultra, Ultra Dominion, we rule one of his attack die, but so we're not being, we're, we're defending. And so we notice that he has a defense of a black and a red, and he has two black for an attack. So if we'll just we'll just say we didn't use that ability just so we can just go straight ahead. So it's it's Pretty straightforward, a black and a red versus a black and a red for defense. So uh, the attacker, we'll take these two dice, we'll see what we get here. So we're gonna we're gonna count hits. So we got, and if you can see this, there is a black and a shield, and then black, so that's two attacks, that would be two hits, and then we roll the same two dice for the defense, like so, and we rolled now that would have been a great roll for for the for the exploding attack because then we got to re-roll that, but we're not doing that. We're rolling for defense, but we got one shield, and so you take one point of damage from the from that particular attack. And you know, and it might not. And like I said, I'm not using special abilities. I'm not using weapons. I'm not using all, all that stuff. I just wanted to show you the basics of how that works. And so then you just go ahead and place that on there to show that he had taken that hit. Now, and then that would be that. Now. What very likely though, I mean, and this is a very, very austere uh, look at this. Um, this is a situation where pack attacks are definitely needed. You need to have, you, you never want to activate one guy in one spot. And plus, you're never going to have, unless something's really gone wrong, one guy off by himself like that. You're going to have a pack as well. And so, as you're playing the game, um, you're going to be making sure that you have both like your healing units, the ones that can actually support, plus your assault units, 
because everybody's got a specialty, and especially with equipment and everything else. And so you, you want to make sure that you try to gang up on one person if you can get your attack actions to do so. But also you want to make sure that um, like you don't leave yourself hanging out to dry either. You don't want somebody moving in with a bunch of stuff. But I wanted to basically show you how, the, how fighting works. Fighting is very straightforward as far as the dice rolls go. Uh, but, you know, it there's a lot more to it. You know, so what you saw in front of you right there uh, didn't really do the game truly justice, uh, but I wanted to make sure that you understand uh, the mechanisms behind uh, the combat. So, uh, so like if that was my last thing and I did all those attacks or whatever, after that was all done, I would then go to the event deck and I would draw the top event card and see what I got. It says Rock Slide. Uh, move all models off rocks and players choose uh, for their models. So if we had, you know, like let's say guys up on these rocks or whatever, and here, then everybody would have to move move off, you know, because of whatever, like a rumble, and like you could, and then you move on, and so maybe that would be fortuitous. Now we get these two guys over here to help out, you know, maybe we didn't want that over here, you know, so that's the 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 the, the tide of battle, and just to show you some other uh, events that are possible here, um, so you have uh, calm waters, nothing happens, and that you know, and which is nice, you know, because you don't want things to end. But um, tentacoral, all models on coral hexes may not move until after the next event is drawn. You know, so there's stuff like that that they can uh, prevent you from moving. Just grab another one here. Um, I like this one actually. Uh, hungry lurkers, move all revealed lurkers one hex, and you spin the card. Literally, you take the card and you spin it like this, and then that is the direction uh, that the that the the lurkers that are have been revealed uh, will move. And so then after both turns are done, as I said, there is a lurker turn. So if you have this giant lurker sitting here, he's going to attack um, anything that's within one range of one. And so then each one of those lurkers uh, has, uh, let me see if I can find the giant uh, mutated, yeah, there we go, uh, mutated troll shark. And so then he would, you would roll and if there's one next to him, he'd attack. If both of you, uh, like, let's say we are unlucky, so we, there's that guy and that guy, they're two different sides and they're, they're worth one range, then to see who he attacks, what happens is, is that both players, after all, two red dice, whoever gets the most hits on those two red dice is going to pick, oh, that was actually good, there was an exploding one and, and, and a non-one, so let me see if my exploding one got a bonus here. I wouldn't, so that would have been a tie, and so you'd roll again, so we figure out, but as soon as one person wins that contest, uh, whoever then would pick who they attacked. Then you'd go through the whole process, as you can probably guess, where here's the big, you know, two blacks and a red versus the defense. So let's say this hapless guy got attacked again, and so we have two blacks and a red to show that he, the mutated troll shark attacks him. And so, well, I only got one exploding one here. Let's see if we can get another one. There's another, so two, three. And so then we have uh, three hits, and then remember he had a black and a red for defense. We'll go ahead and roll those. I didn't get any defense, so he'd take three more points of damage because the mutated troll shark decided to make his uh, make his life miserable in that particular spot. So, uh, and then of course, it, you know, so that uh, you know is something you have to look forward to as well. And I kind of like these guys. They're kind of they add a little. Um, uh, uh, adventure to the game, if you will, like kind of a little, little more uh, theme to it, a little more role playing, if you will, and they're 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 like a fun addition uh, to the game. So, as I as I've said several times, um, this is a this is a game that back and forth, back and forth, until somebody has lost every single one of their units, and as soon as that happens, they obviously have lost, and the other person is proclaimed the winner of the game of rivals. So, all right, so there you go. Uh, that's how to play the game. Hope you have a good idea of how it is played. And uh, let me tell you exactly, uh, go on a little bit more about the things that I liked about this game uh, in my conclusion. All right, if you sat through that, thank you very much. If you didn't, well, I understand. So <laughs> that was Rivals, and I, I, I hope you have a pretty good idea of how uh, to play the game. I went through a lot of ideas of how is what I was going to show you. I just basically I wanted to show you as much of the game as I possibly could. I couldn't really show you the combat the really way, way I wanted to without uh, basically the, the video being even like an extra 20 minutes long. And this was already I knew this was going to be a kind of a long one as it was, just because there's a lot of information out there. But as I said during the gameplay portion. 
action, there is a lot going on with the combat that I couldn't really show you. There's tons of different things that happen with the different abilities, the different weapons, the different armor, um, the, the loot that you find, and the different, uh, just what you're activating, the, the spots you're acti the, the spots you're attacking, the, the units that are there, and those abilities, and things like that. I, I, I welcome you to go and check out the game on the Kickstarter page, and also on Board Game Geek, and so you can kind of read more about the different information that is located there. Um, you know, so ultimately, I, I think I, I told you pretty well what I really liked about this game in, in the uh, explaining how the game is played, but in case you skip that, or, or basically what what I really, really liked about this game, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for these types of games. I, I really enjoy um, the, the whole process of, of picking a team, uh, putting it out there, and then me and another person matching wits and matching tactical know-how and trying to, like, gain the upper hand and, 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 and face it, you I mean both make good choices, but also get lucky with some, some die rolls. And um, I've always enjoyed uh, this chaotic uh, method uh, of, of madness, if you will, in these types of games, you know, just and how, how luck can turn with, with, with the roll of a single die. And and uh, I, I, obviously this is a very thematic game. It is a very, you know, I hate to use the term, but a very Ameritrash type game. And, um, you know, what, what has to happen for me with these games is that, um, you know, well, I mean, besides just being fun and being cool, the theme has to grab me. And I'm a big sucker for Jules Verne, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, uh, you know, the whole, like, also with the steampunk thing going on, the weird squid monster things going on. I mean, it was like, basically, when I, when I saw this game and I saw what it was, I was like, this is, like, totally cool. I mean, it was like, the, the theme just totally jumped out of me as far as, like, Nobody's done anything like this. I mean, yes, I mean, I think there's been games out there that have been about, like, underwater battles and what have you, but I mean, I can remember watching the James Bond movie Thunderball, and, like, when those guys, when all those different uh, agents or whatever are shooting spear guns at each other and, and, and fighting, I mean, those are things that I, 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 I like that, that element. I mean, and, and coming from my, like, kind of D&D background, there's nothing I like more than, like, putting my players into, like, situations where they have to go underwater and they have to fight underwater and be affected by that. And so I'm, I'm really taken with the, the whole uh, you know, for, for la I was going to say immersive, but I mean submersive theme, if you will. And, 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 I, and I greatly enjoy uh, what they brought out. I like the, the, the weird world they've created. Um, you know, I mean, I don't know where their inspiration is, but obviously, I mean, you know, it's just like I said, it's kind of a steampunky thing, but I mean, I totally... I saw, I saw, I, I was seeing Cthulhu and I was seeing Steampunk and I thought that was just really, really cool and, and a really neat uh, idea that the designers had with this one. Um, as I said during the thing, I really liked the, the activation process of, of doing your turns. I, I love the fact that like you basically were like, I'm going to move these guys and like you have to do that whole process. You can't stop your half movement. Okay, now I'm going to do an attack. Now you do your whole movement for that one hex, but then, like I said, you, you, you can then activate that hex to attack, or you can activate another hex to attack, and depending on how that does, then you activate this one again, and and so there's just this, this awesome fluidity and, like, versatility uh, of your different actions, and it was such a big step above the standard, okay, I go, you go, as I said, you know, just like, I'm going to move this guy, and I'm going to attack, now you go, I'm going to move this guy, and attack, okay, you go, and, you know, and like I said, it's very likely maybe there's a game out there that, that has this uh, mechanism like to activate your, your groups. But, I mean, the way this was presented and the way it was presented to me, I just feel like I'd never really experienced that before. And and I really, really liked it. And and I think that if you like these kind of tactile games, I mean, and like you probably have maybe have more experience uh, with them, you know, because, I mean, I'll fully admit that I, I haven't played every single one of them that's out there. But if you, if you haven't experienced that, I think... Like, you have to really play it to understand it just because of the way that you can study the board and figure out which ones you're going to move and which ones you're not. Um, as I mentioned, I really like the, the, the lurker spots. I really like the, the NPC monsters, if you will, uh, that, that will pop out and, and make your day miserable. Um, you know, if it was just the two, two sides battling it out, I mean, that would be fine. The game would be amazing and it would be fun anyway. But that added aspect of, of, like, you know, having that creature. And the thing is, is that you can, like, you, you can search it and, like, and with no intention, really, of fighting it. You're just searching it to, like, basically, like, 
put this block in in like you know in in that little spot of the thing and they they work really well for that you know and plus once you're strong enough and you feel you can move in there and take it out it's 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 basically like a uh a, a a treasure chest generator because you take it out and then you can like search the spot if you will and plus they're very good strategic spots as well because they they give you that bonus to defense i mean just all of those things really lead it to that immersive atmosphere, that thematic atmosphere, that storytelling atmosphere um, that, that allow me to like get into the game, uh, cheer my good fortune, curse my bad luck, and just have a lot of fun uh, with the other people that are at the table because uh, we're all experiencing uh, that, that, that energy and that action all at the same time. So uh, for all those reasons and more that I could not go into, I highly recommend Rivals. If you are a fan of this type of game, this this tactical miniatures battle game, I strongly suggest you check this one out. I don't think you're going to be disappointed. The the miniatures are beautiful. Uh, the gameplay is fluid and fun, and uh, it is just uh, highly recommended. Highly, highly recommended. So, uh, thank you, as always, for taking the time to watch this video. I greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions about the game, and please ask away. I'll answer those uh, as the best I can. And, uh, as always, until next time, you have yourself one heck of an awesome day. All right. Bye-bye.